Everything that Jesus has to offer is free, amen. And everything is available to us. The Bible says again in Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were doing those things that we shouldn't have been doing, we were doing those things that were detestable to God. When we were running from God, he was there searching after us, waiting for us to come home, amen. While we were doing all those things, Jesus was coming to earth. Or even before we were doing those things, people were doing those things all along. And Jesus was coming to earth, sacrificing his life to live a sinless life. And then paying the ultimate price by dying on a cross for us. And then rising again on the third day. If that's not unconditional love, I don't know what is. So in this mid-year reset series, the main focus of it is so that we refocus and we understand what Christ died for us and that if he did all those things, that shouldn't he be important to us? We're trying to make our relationship with Christ the main focus of our life again. Amen. We're trying to go back to the basics, removing all those things that are hindering us from getting close to him or getting removing all those things that r hinder us from getting close enough to him closer than we are right now closer than we were when we first met him even that being said today's message is entitled who is your master who is your master 2 Corinthians 5, I'm going to start in verse 16. It says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Verse 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And verse 18 says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. I'm going to pray. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, the name above all names, Father. On this day, on this weekend that the world is celebrating freedom, Father, we celebrate freedom from sin, freedom from oppression, freedom from all those things that held us back. Freedom from bondage. Father, we thank you for the work that Jesus did and we are gracious for that. Father, help us to truly understand what it is that he died for. Father, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive the words that you have for us today, Father. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. July 1st, we started a 60-day reset to remove those bondages and change us in a way that not on the outside where we lose weight, but on the inside. Amen. Amen. You can change the physical, but you can still feel the same inside. But if you change the inside, the outside doesn't matter. But eventually, the outside is going to line up with what the inside looks like. Amen? During this 60 days that started July 1st, by the way, I'm doing okay so far, just so you know. Normally, the first week in or so, that's not too bad with me. I'm okay with, with giving stuff up. It's keeping it off. That's what matters, right? So I'm doing okay right now. But during the 60 days, we're making forever changes, amen? Because once and forever, we are breaking strongholds that the enemy has had over us, sometimes for years, Amen? The enemy wants to hold you back from getting closer to God because if you get closer to God, the enemy knows that you're going to understand more about who you are in Christ and you're going to understand that he has truly has no power over you. Amen? 
So that's what this is about. It's not about taking away things. It's about adding things. Amen? It's not about just saying that we want to change, but actually changing. Amen? This series is not about placing burdens on people, but instead it's about freeing us from those struggles and bondages that we've been carrying along with us, that we've been putting in our backpacks and carrying that's been weighing us down for years. Amen? It's about releasing those things that we've been holding on to that's been holding us back. It's like saying you want to move forward, but you're holding on to a rope that's holding you back and saying, I just can't move forward. Well, if you let go of that, it makes it so much easier to move forward. Amen? We're not focusing on what we're giving up, but instead we're focusing on the goal, our destination, because the destination sets our course. The destination tells us where we want to be, and that makes it easier to go where we want to go. Amen? If you know your destination and where you want to be, you have your goal in mind. And once you have your goal in mind, your destination, you know how to get there. That's why the Bible says without vision, a people perish. Without a focus of where we're going to, we'll perish because then we're just going to be running around in circles not knowing where we want to go. Amen. A lot of people when they don't truly know their destination and they don't truly know where they want to go, they take detours all along their Christian walk. If they don't truly focus on God, they might go to the left or to the right. You know what? I want God, but you know what? I want somebody else in my life. They may not be that godly, but you know what? I'm going to make them godly. You've probably heard that before. You might have even said it before. That's not the way it works. If it doesn't line up with God, it's not worth it, amen. God has a better plan for you. Amen. Too many times we get off track and God recalculates our path to get us back on track. And then once we get it back on track, we're like, hallelujah, God put us back on track. I'm good to go now. And then we start veering off again. He says, do not sway to the right or to the left. Amen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Change starts with one step and it starts with changing or adjusting one thing. And that one thing will snowball into everything else that you do. Amen. With one step, you decide to live a more godly life. And with one more step, you continue down that path and make lasting changes throughout your life. But the problem is, and the biggest reason we're willing to take that first step is comfort. Comfort. Complacency. Liking where we're at too much that we don't want to change and move forward. Amen. Liking where we're at, being comfortable. It's like when it's time to wake up in the morning and you turn down the air at night, even though you knew it was going to cost you money. So you turn down the air and you get in bed and you're underneath the covers and you're like, man, this feels good. And then the alarm goes off and you're like, I don't want to get up because it's cold outside because I turn, it's cold in the house. And the covers are warm, right? That comfort makes us stay there longer than we really should have, right? Comfort makes you stay places longer than you really should. Amen? Knowing that you have to get up and you have to move forward. We have become comfortable being lukewarm Christians. We have been become comfortable making Jesus a convenience. Amen? Well, when it's convenient for me to serve Jesus, I will. When it doesn't take that much sacrifice, I'll move forward. When faced with a decision to sacrifice, to change to get better, or stay in the place where you're that comfortable, most ple people will choose comfort over sacrifice. Amen? 
most people will keep doing exactly what they're doing. Amen? But the sad thing is comfort is sinking sand. When you're comfortable, you're eventually going to start sinking and moving back. Amen? Turn with me to Matthew 6. And we're going to start in verse 19. Matthew 6. And we're going to start in verse 19. The only way to stop the cycle of comfort is to taking that first step out of your comfort zone and into where God's called you to be. Amen. Matthew 6, starting verse 19, it says this. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money or mammon. This entire passage, and we're going to move on, so stay right there in chapter 6, but this entire passage is talk about treasure. Showing you how we relate treasure and how much we hold on to it. Amen? So, it relates to the treasures of heaven against the treasures of this earth. Now, the treasures... True treasures can only come from God, amen? And I want you to notice in Matthew 6, 24, it says, you cannot serve both God and money or mammon. Now that word in the Greek does not say money, it actually says mammon. And the word mammon is actually the, a demon god a pride, avarice, and greed. Now, if that word actually was currency, this would be a very weird statement for Jesus to say. He would be saying, you cannot serve both God and currency. That doesn't even make sense. Currency is an object. You can't serve an object. Amen? Amen? If Jesus was saying currency, he would have had to say, you cannot wor worship both God and currency. See there? You can worship an object, but you can't serve an object. Amen? But that word, money, doesn't mean currency. It means the demon god of money, wealth, possessions, and greed. Amen? See, you can't serve an object, but you can serve a person or a demon. So what Jesus is saying here is when you place those things above Him, when you take for granted what God has done for you, and you say, you know what, I'm going to worship this tool that He created for you, you're actually not worshiping money. You're worshiping a, the demon God of money, wealth, and greed. So by placing a higher value on your currency, it's more than just saying, hey, you know what? I'd like money. It's actually submitting yourself and serving a demon God. And money is a tool. A tool can be used for God or the enemy or not used at all. It can be used for yourself. Money is a tool. 
Money has no value. It is not demonic or not demonic. Amen? It can be used for good or evil. It doesn't matter. But Jesus said this, and this is interesting. He says, you cannot serve both God and mammon. He, you cannot serve both God and mammon. There's nothing else that Jesus said in the Bible that you cannot serve both God and this. That's the only thing that Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and that. Actually, Jesus would have never said you can't serve both God and people because we were called to serve people. Jesus called us to serve people. He told us the greatest among you will be the one who serves the most. He's talking about serving people. Jesus placed no value on things that didn't have value. I'm not saying that money doesn't have value. It does. It's very valuable. We can't do anything without money in this society. Amen? This society runs on money for the most part. But the fact is, you use it as a tool. You don't worship it. Amen? When, when there's a difference, he told a story of the sheep and the goats, and there's a difference between when we want to hold on to our money because we're not helping someone out, amen? Or when we want to sacrifice the things of God so we can serve money, amen? He didn't say you can use it. He didn't say you didn't need it. He didn't say not to have it. What he did say was not to serve it, amen? It's a big difference. Money is not bad. Money has no demonic activity in it at all. It's currency. Amen? So Jesus is telling us why we shouldn't hold on to this world's treasure. Amen? Closer than we hold on to the treasures of this world. And he goes on in verse 25. It says, therefore I say to you. Now notice this. He says, therefore, in verse 25. So right before that, in verse 24, he says, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Therefore, when he says therefore, he's continuing on with a thought that he was already talking about. Amen. He says, therefore, I say to you, in order so you won't serve mammon, I'm telling you this. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature or one inch to his height? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not say, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek after. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. See, Jesus is telling you, look, in order for you not to serve mammon over God, I'm going to tell you how to do that. Don't worry about everything else around you and worry about yourself. Amen? Don't worry about your food because I provide for everything. I provide for even the sparrows. Amen? Will he not provide for you? He loves you. You're created in his image. 
He cares more about you than anything else on this world. When God created everything, he looked at it and said it was good. But when he created man, he said it was very good. You're better than anything else in this world. And yet he takes care of everything else. And we worry that God won't take care of us. The biggest lie from the enemy is making you believe that God doesn't love you. Amen? Because once you understand that God loves you, you understand that God will provide for you. That he's unlike any earthly father that you've ever had. He's without sin. He loves more than anybody else in this world. The, the greatest person on this earth that loves you, he loves you 1,000 times greater than that. Infinite amount. He knows every thought that you have. Every issue that you have in your life, and he still loves you. Unconditionally. Amen? He knows those things that you hide from everyone, and he still loves you. Jesus said there's no reason to heap up treasures on this earth because all you're doing is heaping up things that God will already provide for you. There's probably a joke that went along with this, but there's a, a guy who goes up to heaven. He's a rich man, and he's about to go to heaven, and the angel comes down and says, look, you got 30 seconds. Anything you want to take, grab it. So he gets his bag open. He starts throwing in gold bars because he's a rich man, and he's like, I got it. He gets his bag full of gold bars, and he goes up, and he gets to the gate, and St. Peter's there. He's like, hey, why'd you bring the pavement? <laughs> the things we value on this earth are far different than what we will value one day in heaven. Amen? We need to refocus and understand that this life is not about collecting. It's about giving. Amen? It's about understanding who you are in Christ and understanding that we have the ability on this earth because Jesus died for us and gave us that right. We have the ability to live like Jesus today. The devil has no power over you. The devil has no power to make you sin. You don't have to worry about that. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 6. Jesus was telling us how we can live on this earth. And we're going to get into that a little bit deeper. And I want to... I want you to understand that this is not, everybody struggles. There, there's, there's no shame in struggling, amen? The biggest thing that causes most of our struggles or all of our struggles is not being close enough to Jesus Christ. The closer you are to Jesus, the less you worry about this life. The closer you are to Jesus, the less stress you have on your life. He is the Prince of Peace. He brings peace to your life. He comforts you when you need it. Anything that we have, about 90% of the things we deal with are from not being close enough to Jesus. Amen? So, we have a choice to make once we become Christians because we know who we are and we know what we can do. We know that the enemy has no power over us. So when the enemy comes to tempt us with things, we have a choice right there. The Bible says that he will always give you a way out. Amen? Always. So we can never 
have the excuse to say, the devil made me do it. Amen? Right? 1 Corinthians 6. And... I'm going to start in verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with one another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are judged to the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those who are, whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there's nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? He's writing this to a church, by the way. He's saying, hey, if there's something involved in the church, you should be able to take care of it. If there's something involved in the people in the area and they come to you, you should be able to answer them. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> but instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? He's saying it would be better for you not to take your disputes out to the community and sue each other because you both know Christ and how bad does that look? Amen? So then it says, instead you yourselves cheat and do wrong and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Wrongdoers meaning people that are still wrong and have not accepted Jesus Christ. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. He says that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. He's saying, look, it doesn't matter what you did before. He said you were washed clean by Jesus Christ. So you have escaped judgment because Jesus Christ stands before you when you go to judgment and it says, it's covered under the blood. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. You may have to answer for that. There are seeds that you sown that will reap a harvest in your life. But that doesn't mean that God holds it against you anymore. Amen? Amen? doesn't matter what kind of background you have. It doesn't matter the immoralities that you've done. It's covered under the blood. Amen? Amen. It says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. Let me read that again. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. We have a right to do everything because we've been set free, but everything is not beneficial. Because if we start dabbling in things and we start getting in things, we're going to become a slave to whatever it is we dabble in. And you say, but I'm saved. Well, that doesn't matter. You can still be a slave to sin even though you're saved. Amen? There are several times in the Bible that the Bible says in Jesus' time, he says, this person has a devil or this per the devil has this person. God and the devil are the same in this sense. 
They both want to control. Hold on. I don't want to say that because that doesn't sound right. <laughs> they both want to see your life reflect them. I was going to say they both want to control your life, but God doesn't want to control your life. The devil does. They both want your life to reflect their characteristics. The Holy Spirit is with you so that you can, well, can guide you and help you reflect the characteristics of God. And the, the devil tries to tempt you so that your life reflects the characteristics of him. Amen? It says, you say, food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Now, this, this, this is quoted quite a bit, so. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. But you do, you do not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with body with her. For it is said the two will become one flesh. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to stop there. But what he's saying is, if you give your life to Christ, why would you go out and do anything else? Why would you go out and unite yourself with anything else that is ungodly? Why would you go and your, unite yourself, which is your body is Christ, and say, you know what, I'm going to forget about Christ right now and then go do something that's very ungodly. Amen? So we need to understand, it goes on to verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples for the Holy Spirit? And the Spirit of God who's in you, whom received from God, and you are not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. Amen? We should keep ourselves clean just for the matter of it keeps us closer to God. And many people say, well, God hasn't told me to remove that. That's not true. He said it in his word. Amen? It doesn't take God telling you audibly to remove that from your life. Anything that you see is a hindrance for you. Anything that you see is causing you issues. Anything that you see that doesn't glorify God should be removed from your life. I'm not saying that it doesn't make you a Christian to have troubles and issues in your life. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, it's a sign of maturity when you start removing things, even though God hasn't led you to remove them. Amen? Because the closer you get to Jesus, the more you want his life reflected in your, in your actions. Amen? It's like when I was a sinner, B.C., before Christ. My life reflected everything that the enemy wanted me to reflect in my life. I was a good sinner. I did a good job. I did a good job where most people could tell that I did not serve Jesus. But... Once I gave my life to Christ, I basically did a 180. I started removing things. I didn't even feel like God was leading me to do it. I just dropped them. I just knew it wasn't right to do. So I stopped it. We don't have to be led by God to drop things. When God tells you to remove something, you darn well better drop it then. Amen? Because there's a reason for it. But he's the reason we drop things is so we won't continue to serve the enemy. So we won't continue to be in bondage with the enemy. 
So if I'm sitting here and doing things and I'm hiding it from my family, I'm hiding it from everybody, guess what? The devil can hold me into bondage over that. He can say, you know what? They won't love you if you tell them that. What happens if you get caught? You're going to lose everything. See, you can't have secrets. You can't have secret sins because eventually they will be found out. Just drop everything and then you won't have to worry about it. The enemy holds those things over you. He's like, hey, how can you go talk to someone about Jesus when you're not even living a godly life? Everybody at church said, thinks you're so awesome. But in reality, I know how horrible you are. That's what the devil's saying. But in reality, the devil don't know anything because guess what? All that was covered on the blood. You're a new creation. New creations don't have history. New creations don't have past. New creation is clean, brand new, starting over. Just like he said, it doesn't matter what you've done because it's covered. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. You were sanctified and justified. Amen? That's all that matters. So we should start living like it. Amen? We should change our lives to reflect what God has done in it. Amen? You know, I got a question for you. Let's say you're driving along, and I'm going to close out after this, but this is a good story that, that God gave me. Let's say you're driving along, you're driving along the road, and you're being a good Christian, so you see this hitchhiker on the side of the road, and you pick him up. It's late, late at night, but you do it anyway. So you pick him up, you're driving along, they're like, hey, uh, could you stop here for a moment at the store? And you know the store's closed, but you stop anyway. And the person is there, and they try to grab you. They try to kill you and everything. They try to tie you up, right? But you get away. You get back to your car, and you take off. You call the cops. They haven't found the person or anything like that. But then later on, you're driving along similar area, and you see that person on the side of the road. Would you pick them up then? How many people would pick that person up still? Nobody. Nobody would pick up somebody that tried to do that to them, right? Well, I'm going to ask you a question. Why do we try to pick up those things that we already let go of in our life that was destroying our life? We say, you know what? I stopped that because it was destroying my life. It was going to kill me. And then guess what? We're we'll running along later. Again. Oh, you know what? That don't sound so bad anymore. I'm going to pick that stuff up again. We're picking up the same things that we already let go of. That was trying to kill us. That would be like picking up somebody who tried to murder you. That doesn't make sense. It says your bodies is a temple for the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. If something's going to destroy your body, don't hold on to it. Let it go. Kick it out of the car. Right? No matter where we're at, no matter what we're doing, we have to get away from those things. And we can't pick them back up anymore. Those things are destroying us. Jesus set you free from those things. 
He said, you know what? It is finished. Don't pick up sins that you've laid down. Don't pick up depression that you used to be in. When you get free from it, leave it alone. Let it go. Tell the devil he ain't allowed in your car anymore. Make a free will decision to follow God and only allow what God has for you in your life. Amen. Colossians 2.13 says this, that you were dead in your transgressions and sins, but were made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses and sins. Amen. So I'm going to tell you there's three different deaths that a person can have. A physical death is when the spirit is separated or leaves the body. Spiritual death is when the spirit is separated from God. That's before you get saved. You don't have God's spirit in you, amen? You could be spiritually dead, but still walking around. Eternal death is when the spirit is separated from God with no hope of reconciliation. That's when the Spirit is separated from God, when you don't know Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit doesn't live inside of you, and there's no hope for reconciliation. That means with your last breath, you chose not to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's eternal death. And that happens only after physical death, after the person has breathed their last breath. There's no chance to reconcile with God. But physical life is when someone is connected to God and God is joined together with them in their body. Amen. But I want to close with one simple question. It's the same title as the message. Who is your master? Who is your master today? Is your spirit subject to your soul? Is your spirit subject to your flesh or is your flesh subject to your spirit? Is your mind, will, and emotions subject to God or is God just subject to whatever box you put him in and decide when you need him? Do you place a higher desire on God's desires for your life or your own desires for your life? Do you live a God or spirit-led life or do you live a self-led life? Who's in charge of your life today? Who's in charge of your life today? Are you your master? Is the enemy your master or is God your master? That's the biggest question for us today. Because if you're your master, and God's never been your master. It's time to get right with God, amen? It's time to give your life to Jesus Christ and let him change your life. But even sometimes we can get off track, and we can want to run our own life. We can run our life as long as we do it by God's blueprint, by God's procedures, amen? Amen? God gives us free will, but we just need to run it by his blueprint, by his design, amen? And if we do that, God will take us and use us for a greater glory than we could ever do for ourselves. We'll have greater happiness, greater peace than we could ever have imagined if we do it God's way. But that's the only way to do it in reality, we don't want to pick up murderers on the side of the street and say, hey, you want to drive my car? Take me wherever you want to go. That seems silly, but we do it every day when we choose what the enemy wants to do in our life. Amen.